are in listen-only mode. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining today's webinar presentation featuring Carl Palachuk as our presenter. Before we begin, I just want to go over a couple of quick housekeeping items. First of all, we welcome your questions, so if anything comes to mind, please be sure to use the questions feature to ask Carl. Um, also, for those of you in the Denver area, we're pleased to have our next SME Nation Emerging Technology Tour stop on May 16th at the University of Denver, and we'd love to see you all there. Um, also, this session will be recorded, and you guys will receive a replay link within 24 hours of the webinar. So I think I've taken enough of your time, so I'll just pass it on over to Carl. Take it away. Very good. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I will be in Denver, so if uh, you guys want to attend that event in Denver, you can buy me a beer. So we're going to talk today about a specific way of approaching project management. And you know, we, there's always issues in IT about projects that are having problems, and we all know what those problems are. So we're going to go through a little bit of that. We're going to talk about what is a project and why we get into trouble, and then specific approach that you can use to get out of this. And uh, I'll leave some time at the end for questions. So if you have questions, just jot those down. We're going to look at this kind of like a university. So we're going to look at the different kinds of things. You know, you might have an economics class, a business class, and so forth. So we're going to look at it in that way. So at, at what we're going to call Project Management University for the day, our interest exam is very straightforward. This is your, this is your one question I'm going to tell you right now for the final exam is, what's the most important concept for completing projects on time and under budget while accomplishing all established goals? So write me an essay about that in the next hour, and then we will come back to this and we'll answer this question. I think it will be very straightforward at the end. But one of the things that you notice when you take a Microsoft exam is they, they have these fairly complicated questions sometimes where they say your goals are that, for example, you want to save the client money, you want to create a secure environment, you need to be able to route IP across a certain set of networks, and you need to do it well, you're making room for one or two machines who are still on older technology, right? So they have those kinds of questions where they have the high priority items and the medium priority items and the low priority items. And your goal is to choose which of the answers best accomplishes most or all of those goals. And that's the kind of scenario that they put in those tests because it's the kind of thing that we find in real life. So we need to figure out how can we approach project management in a way that it's simple enough so that we're actually managing the project instead of just letting things happen, but that it's sophisticated enough that we actually know that, that we've got these goals in mind and everybody from top to bottom can follow them. Now, one of the problems that we have is that sometimes the salespeople and the technical people have two different views about what happens in the world. So even if you're a sole proprietor and you're talking to another sole proprietor, there are four kinds of players who are sitting down at a sales meeting. One is, and again, this could be both of the clients can be inside the head of, head of one person. But there's a dreamer and there's a realist. And the dreamer says, oh, I want this amazing network that never goes down and everything's perfect and life is good and all the children are above average. And then you say, okay, well, that's going to be $100 million. And they say, oh, okay, well, what can you do for $2,000, right? So, so there's a, at some point there's a realist who says, okay, I know I can't have absolutely everything, but realistically we need to do these couple of things. So whatever the goal might be that we want to increase security or we want to increase speed or whatever it might be, they've got uh, both the dreamer part and the realist part. And on your side, again, both of these can be inside one head, but you've got the salesperson and you've got the technician or the programmer who's trying to get something designed. So the salesperson wants to maximize the amount of money that they're able to bring into your company. And so, especially if it is a separate human being, they might be tempted to sell something that you don't actually deliver. And so there's a potential issue with that. And then there's the a technician or programmer who says, well, wait a minute, let's, let's keep this on the side of reality. You know, let's not get too carried away 
and just make up stuff that we can't actually deliver. So those are the competing realities of what's going on inside of uh, any sales meeting. And you need to keep that in mind when you go to sales meetings that there's a little bit of all of this. And quite honestly, everybody knows that these competing uh, realities are going on. So you have to figure out like how we're going to deal with that when you get into the sales meeting. In a perfect process, you've got this, this complicated uh, process of defining a project and deliverables. You meet and, and you say, okay, so what are we going to do? And they say, we need to completely revise this network and upgrade the equipment and replace whatever half the desktop, something like that. Well, you don't know what's involved in that. Even if you're the person who is maintaining that network from A to Z, you have to go do some kind of a site survey, and you have to spend some labor figuring out whether or not you really need that 24-port switch or whether you can replace it with a couple of different switches or do you need to have um, you know, a 10-gig backbone between two switches, whatever it is. You need to do some engineering to define that project. And in the perfect world, in the ideal process, that's billable. That discovery part is billable. All of that putting together an actual proposal is billable. And then you're going to agree on the project. And you're going to sign a contract for the project. You can divide it into stages. The work begins on time, ends on time. It's completed on time. Everybody's happy. And that's the way things should work. And if you've been involved in really large projects or with state agencies or some larger companies, you may have actually experienced it. But more than likely, in the small business space, it's a different story. And I love to tell the story about you know when I was selling programming. We have sold a couple million dollars worth of programming uh, at one point. And every time we go into a, a project, the client would say, oh, I just need this little bitty thing. right? I, I just need this tiny little program that's only got to do three things. And it's like building a house. Somebody tells you, oh, we just need that little two-room shack. So you build them the two-room shack, and they come back and they say, well, uh, where's the bathroom? I say, OK, so it's two rooms and a bathroom. And they go, yeah, but you need a kitchen. You can't, you can't not have a kitchen. Or where's the upstairs, and where's the rec room? And you know, pretty soon, they've got this mansion. And the problem is they have not wanted to go through the process of planning and project management. They didn't want to define what we were up to. They just wanted to move ahead. And the reason is, very frequently with a, a good size programming, um, you're going to need to spend ten or $20,000 to properly define the project. But that's always going to save you money in the long run. Because what happens is they say, well, our, our entire budget is 50000 Oh, OK. So they just start programming. And you're doing the best you can to figure out what they need as you go along. But obviously, you're only going to build what you, you know. When they come to you and they say, I need to add this and I need to add that, now they've hobbled it together. So this isn't like they started with a two-room shack and ended up with a really nicely designed mansion. No, they started with a two-room shack, and they ended up with this Frankenstein house where things are just glommed onto it, and they don't really fit very well, and things are, are made to kind of get by. And so you end up having built a huge, cumbersome project that doesn't need to be that way. And that's the kind of thing we want to avoid in our business, is where people just say, just jump in and start doing it. So without having designed things properly, you jump into a project that can't really be successful because of the way that it, it evolved. And it, it will always be less satisfying to the end user client than if you had taken the time to do it right the first time. And so that's one of the hugest challenges that we have in the small business space, is that nobody wants to pay for that initial uh, project definition. So let's look at a project. A project for this discussion is any process that takes more than two steps. So think what that means. For most of us, changing a password is not a project. Control-Alt-Delete, enter password. 
But for some clients, and I think you all have seen them, that all the passwords are kept at the front desk. There's somebody who's in charge of all that. They've got a big binder. You go to them and you say, I want to change Lisa's password. And they say, OK, so here's the list of acceptable passwords. And we need to make sure that it's consistent and she uses the same password on the Windows logon, on PC law, and on, you know, did, 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 that they put this password into six different places. And they manage it and they keep track of it and all that. In that kind of environment, changing a password is a project. So now, having said that, many, many projects can be executed with simple checklists. Because you can have a checklist that says, here's, here's what you do. You go to the person in the front office, you request the password, she's going to pick it off a list, and you're going to change it in these five places. Right? When, when you do that, tick, 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 you have created a quick and easy checklist to make sure that when you do change a password in that ridiculous environment, you don't miss anything, and you make sure that it's done on all of the different places it needs to get done. So. That's the kind of thing where projects can exist in places where you didn't think of it as a project, but at the same time, you can take and make short work of it by creating a checklist. So not everything needs the kind of formal management that a larger project does. On the other hand, if you have a server migration, that's a project that needs to be handled in the way that we're going to talk about today. If you have a, a move from one ISP to another, a move from one email provider to another, things like that that can cause downtime or anything that can take a long time. We have had server migrations that took months simply because we moved the data in one stage and then we took a machine out of service. And then we moved to a different ISP in the middle of the migration and we wanted to separate that from the other thing. And, you know, each of these is a, a major stage that we had to separate from the other major stages. For us personally, we never shut everything down on Friday night, run around praying that we're going to get everything done by Monday and then turn it all up at you know 8 o'clock Monday morning. That's not the way we do migrations. We do everything in real time while the client's still working on the system. So it has to be planned and orchestrated. But it's also the case that those kinds of really cool projects are possible if they're managed properly. So some of the common projects that we have uh, in our space right now are moving from work groups to servers. That's been, um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily been bread and butter, but it's been something that we have done from time to time for the last 20 years. I mean, we've just been moving. The moving people to servers has been a piece of what we've always done. And for a long time, it was moving from one SBS to another, but now it's moving from SBS to other servers, to server essentials or server standards. And obviously, for the last six or seven years, moving people up to the cloud has been a pretty regular project, which means that we get better and better at and we document it, and so it becomes cleaner and smoother every time. So there's all kinds of things where you say, all right, so this is a project. For us, setting up a new PC is a project. So we've got a like a four-page new PC checklist that we go through for every new computer that we put in. And that way we know that it's all done very consistently from one client to the next. We customize these for most of our larger clients because each larger client is going to have their own line of business app. They're going to have their own collection of things. Once in a while, you find somebody that says, Internet Explorer cannot be past service pack you know, two or whatever. They've got certain things where it's got to be an exact precise thing. Or we've even got one where they can't have the, the newest updates to Java. So, you know, when we got something like that, you've got to make sure you've got a checklist so that you do what you're supposed to do and don't do just what comes natural, which is run all the updates until there aren't any more updates. So you need to customize those for each client. But again, no matter how complicated that is, once you've got that checklist in place, uh, you can basically guarantee yourself success. So what makes projects fail? And the number one answer survey says it's filtering. And so let's look at why projects get in trouble. Um, scope creep is the most common one. 
I will never forget, I learned this lesson very early on when I went into consulting on my own. I had a client that I would come in and they would say, oh, as long as you're here to set up that new printer, I brought in this machine from home, I'm trying to get both a C and a D drive to work and I can't get it to recognize them both at the same time, can you take a look at that? So this is back in the days where you had to move jumpers and whatever. I go sidetrack on this thing and try to figure out what he's mucked up and try to fix it and straighten it out and not do something to mess up the data he's already got in place. And when I'm done, you know, I take my notes, I fill it all out, I go to the client who says, wow, you billed me three hours for setting up a printer. Are you, like, completely incompetent? And I said, hey, you sidetracked me on this whole machine that you brought in. And then he's mad at me because he got a big bill for it. So that's the kind of thing that happens at a much higher scale on big projects. I have seen network migrations where people say, as long as you're here, we want to go ahead and upgrade Office on everybody's desktop. And I'm saying, no, no, no. That, that's not part of this project. You know? And so it's one of those things where people, they, clients will, in their own head, have unspoken ideas about what's going on. They think, well, an upgrade's an upgrade. If you're going to upgrade, you've got to upgrade. What's the point of upgrading and not upgrading Microsoft Office? And to their mind, that makes perfect sense, right? They're not technicians. This is not their job. So you can get in trouble if you let the scope creep. And um, obviously, that affects profitability and money and so forth. The other thing is delivery dates. A lot of times, clients don't get that they have caused some big problem, and then that moves the delivery date. If you say, well, we should have this done by the end of the month, we're going to go through and, for example, let's say that you're going to uh, gradually go through and clean up the mailboxes for everybody in the office, archive off what they don't need, get everything under two gigs so you can move it to the cloud, right? and all of that cleanup is going to be done by the end of the month. Okay, great. So you're plugging away doing that, and then somebody says, oh, we have this big thing we got to do, we got a whatever some big research project, we need to go load up all of the PSTs that we've ever archived in the history of the world and go search for some documents related to this one court case. And so you help them with that. Well, then the end of the month comes and they say, hey, how come we're not done with that cleanup project? And you say, well, because you brought in 72 gigs worth of extra data, which we then had to go clean up again. So, you know, cli again, clients don't know what they don't know. So you have to be very careful about how you manage a project in such a way that you manage the expectations along with the project. We also have the case that sometimes you have technicians who don't keep good notes with each other, and the result of that is always rework. When technicians do not communicate with each other, rework is the natural result. You finish setting up a, a half of setting up a machine, and I come in to take over, I don't know where you left off. So I literally have to start at the top and say, okay, yep, looks like Word's up to date. Yep, looks like Adobe Acrobat's up to date. Yep, it looks like it's been connected to the network. Looks like it's got this, oh, nope, it's only got one of the three printers. Like, that's where you left off on the checklist. If you don't communicate with me, I have to go back and check where you left off. So that's the kind of thing where rework always causes problems. So all of those things lead to the, the, the two ways that we measure whether something is, is a failing project is the date and the money. Okay, So you've got to figure out how are we going to solve those two options or those two problems. So the core problem is that these clients don't want to pay for accurate estimates. And so how do we get accurate estimates? And the answer to that is we have to you know, go through one project after another. And this is just kind of a sense of when, when the numbers are high, when the line is high, that means it's more accurate than when the line's low, it's, it's inaccurate. So think about the lifespan of a server. It's introduced and, you know, you don't know anything about how long it's going to take. You could take a wild guess and say it's an hour, but it might be two. And then, especially if you're working on older machines, it's going to take more time. After you do a few installs, then you realize, okay, it's getting a little better, and it's more and more stable, and so your accuracy of time estimates goes up. And then 
uh, there's some big fixes that come out. And sometimes these fixes like, oh, we're going to move to dot, from .NET 3 to .NET 4, and you know, it's going to take a little while and a couple of reboots. So the accuracy of your estimate goes down for a while. And then Service Pack 1 comes out. Right? So what that does is it rolls up all of those fixes, and now you've got a very stable estimate of how long it takes to install the operating system and then install all the fixes. And on the newer systems, thank goodness, finally have reached the point where they, you just have to install the service pack. You don't have to install the operating system because it gets installed with the service pack. So thank goodness we finally reached that uh, point in history for some products. But then, you know, there's always updates. You know, Edge Tuesday comes and goes, and guess what? Um, your accuracy of your time estimate goes down. Then Service Pack 2 comes out, and now your accuracy goes back up, right? So it goes like that over time. Eventually, you get to a point like Small Business Server 2003, it had about three years where we had really, really accurate uh, estimates of how long it was going to take to install uh, that operating system. So once you've got that experience under your belt, you've got some accuracy in terms of how long a project's going to take. This is also the case, not just with an operating system, but with rewiring a rack. If you have the right tools and the right training and the right people, you have some idea of how long it takes you to rewire a rack that's got um, 50 desktops or 20 desktops or 20 desktops and 20 columns, right? Something like that. Those estimates get more accurate over time. And that's actually one of the benefits of the small business space is that so much of what we do is very similar from client to client. You get your clients who are five and under, you got your you know six to ten, your eleven to twenty-five. You've got really good estimates if you keep track of it. You've got good estimates of how long many, many projects take. So even with things like the new PC checklist, you should do timestamps at the beginning and the end of each of those and know oh, this, this entire checklist of four pages took me 45 minutes or took me an hour, whatever it might be, so that you've got accurate estimates. Because when somebody comes to you and says, all right, we've got this new network, we're going to be doing this migration, we need, we need new PCs uh, for all of these machines, and there's 32 machines. Okay, 32 machines times my accurate estimate, boom. You've got a number that makes some sense, and you know that you're, you're at least in the ballpark for estimates. Some of these projects become cookie cutter. Like for us, firewall configuration is a really easy cookie cutter project that we create a checklist. You know, you you sit down, you log in, you back up that firewall configuration to the server, and then you proceed down the checklist. And if you sell only one or two brands, then you can actually have click by click. You know, go to this screen, put in this. Um, Pass or NAT or whatever it might be, um, you know, tick, 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 and when you're done, you back it up again, reboot, test everything, right? You've got that entire checklist, so you you can actually hand that work off to somebody who is not the highest level technician in the office, and you'll know that it'll, it'll get done, and you'll know that it'll get done in a timely manner. So those kinds of cookie cutter projects make estimates very easy and it makes it easier for you to stay consistently profitable. Now, just a tiny bit of a side note, one of the easiest ways to stay consistently profitable is to do flat fee projects. A flat fee project almost guarantees that you're going to be profitable if you've got decent time estimates and you add a little percentage to verify that uh, you know, even if it goes over just a little bit, you're still going to be profitable. So think about which kinds of things you do in your business that could be checklists and could become something that uh, is cookie cutter for you. Now, here's an example. We're going to look at an internal and external estimate. So this is just an idea of an estimate for uh, server migration. And the details aren't super important, but basically we've got training at the beginning and the end. We're going to build the server. Uh, that takes a certain amount of time. Uh, we're going to move the data. We're going to migrate the workstation profiles. Right? Tick, tick, tick. Each of these things takes a certain amount of time. And, and at the bottom, so it, you know, it adds up to 30 hours. We had three hours, 10% buffer, just 
for administering the project. And that means that we really think that it's going to be 33 hours of billable time. And let's just, this is low, but let's say that you have a 50% billability. 50% okay, billability means that overall on your team, it's going to cost you 66 hours of labor to produce 33 hours of billable labor. So now you have to come up with 66 hours, and let's say that your, your cost for that with labor plus insurance and so forth and so on is, uh, you know, whatever, $75 an hour. You've got an idea of what it's actually going to cost you uh, to produce that. So this is all internal. This is what you see, and then you say, okay, now let me give this to the client. And this adds up at the bottom to almost 5000 So then you go to the client and you say, okay, so we've got hardware up above, labor down below. There's the total. Notice that I don't spell out the individual hours for labor. And the reason for that is very straightforward. What I do not want to have happen is for us to go through, and turns out that the data move was really fast. I, you know, let's say I estimated three hours and it took two. I don't want the client to come to me and say, "Looks like uh, we saved an hour on that, uh, you know, labor there, so we'll be under budget, and you know, I'll get some of my money back." I don't want to hear that. Right? What I want to hear is, "Look, you paid a flat fee for the migration." And we guarantee it's going to get done right. Because what happens if I have two troublesome profile moves, and now suddenly I've lost not only that hour, but another hour, right? I want to have that flexibility within the whole system. So for me, the flat C allows that project to be something that is um, like a black box, right? But labor, labor is there. It's $5,000 worth of labor. Have a nice day. And so the details are less relevant. Now, having said that, each of the items that you see on this become tickets in your ticketing system. So there's actually a service request for staff training. There's a service request for building the server. There's a service request for doing the discovery. There's a service request for uh, network migration. There's a service request for profile migration, so forth. Each of those becomes a um, service request within the system. So now let's look at kind of a generic way that you can manage all projects and you know see how that applies in this case. So we have a set of basic forms that basically say, here's how do we divide our projects into uh, stages. Each of the items on that quote was a stage. And we've got forms that say, OK, here's how we do it, here's the goal for this stage, and here's how we know we're going to be successful. So I think that if you don't have a ticketing system, you need to go get one this afternoon. Uh, the, the, the big players in the space are Autotask, ConnectWise, and TigerPaw. Pick one, period, end of story. Uh, if you don't have one, I promise you, you are losing money. And you're losing money because you're wasting time, and time is uh, as my brother Manuel says, time is your witch, right? So um, you have to determine what constitutes a service request versus a project. So again, we go back to at one office, changing a password is very simple. But uh, at some point, it becomes more complicated. So if you have a project, as a general rule, it's going to need a little bit more management. Service requests generally do not require that level of management. So for us, um, the binder, the project binder that we put together is like a huge big checklist. It's got, uh, you know, we, we look at for each of the stages what are the things we want to accomplish and then we attach specific service requests to each of those stages. When all the service requests are done, when all the stages are done, the work is done. And um, I'm not sure how easy it is to see this, but you'll get the slide so you can review it. But this graphic is just a, an outline of how things flow through your system. You begin the project, you define what it is, and then you've got each stage. So stage one, two, three, four, five, whatever it might be. You might have two stages, you might have ten stages. But in each case, you work that stage, and when that stage is done, it's done. And then the next one, and the next one. So let's say you got six stages. When you're done with all six stages, then everything inside that project is done. And then you do the fine-tuning. 
So if you look to the right, what you see is that sometimes work shows up that is not part of the defined project. So it is determined to be outside the scope of the project. Now, you notice that all of that flows down to the bottom. And there are only three things that can happen to work that's outside the scope. One is that it, it's not needed anymore. For example, if um, Larry was having trouble getting connected to the server, and you've replaced the server, and he finished the migration, Larry better not have an issue connecting to the server, right? That problem should literally have ceased to exist as a result of the project. Uh, similar things happen with printers and network connections and all kinds of stuff. Second thing is that it's a really, really minor thing. Let's say that you're under budget and you're, you've got lots of extra hours, and so somebody comes and says, can you help me just set up a new Outlook signature? And you say, yeah, right? It's going to take me five minutes. We're just going to roll that in, and we're not going to do anything about it. And the third one is the most common, and that is you say the work is outside the scope of the project. So the client comes to you and says, I want you to install as long as you're here, right? To them, technology is this big box that you've opened, right? And they're going to throw everything they can in the box, right? So you show up and they say, I want you to install six copies of Microsoft Office. And you say, you never say no. You say, absolutely. I'm going to create a service request for that because it's outside the scope of what we're here for today. So I promise it will get done. It may not get done today. It may not get done before I leave. Uh, this office today. But it will get done because we're going to create a service request. It'll be in the system, and it'll get done. That does several things for you. One, it guarantees you get paid for that work. Right. So two, you did not say no to the client, but you also taught them that they need to understand that there's a scope of work for every project. You know, when you call Microsoft and you say, I have a server down, they say, okay, what's the issue? And you define this precise issue, and they echo back to you. They, they literally have you orally sign off on the fact that once we get Active Directory up and working and people can log in, this ticket is closed. And then you can say, well, we also have some issues with Exchange. And they will say, great, why don't you call back and create a separate service request for that? So when you work through the process like that, it becomes really clear what's inside the scope and what's outside the scope. And when clients begin to understand that, it's what saves you money. They will hear this again and again. As long as you're here, why don't we set up those printers? Well, okay, we can do that. It's outside the scope of this project, but we will be happy to help you. And on and on and on. So um, eventually they begin echoing back to you. I'd like to set up a new phone system for Mary. Would that be inside the scope or is that outside the scope? And you could say, I'm sorry, that's outside the scope. And they're totally cool with it because at some point they understand it. Now, let's say that, that there's something comes up where you say, we really don't have any choice. We need to uh, replace the switch. We you know, a switch goes bad in the middle of the project, whatever, something like that. You literally stop allocating time on this ticket and you go fix that other thing. So the reason we divided this into tickets is so that it's very easy to stop working on any one of these things, and then uh, the time has stopped. That keeps you inside the budget, and it keeps you inside the time frame. Because even though, the, let's say you've got some issue that you got to go get a part, and you got to wait for something, and, and whatever, your project is on hold for a week, when you come back, you may have missed the date of the 30th, and that's up to you to manage that with the client. But you will not have gone over hours in terms of the total hours allocated to this project. And so it's very, very important to keep the number of hours very, very accurately in order to make sure that you stay inside the scope of your project. So that little process of having everything go over to the right and work its way down and creating separate service requests that is how you make money in project management. So a few things you want to get uh, clear is make sure that you don't have your client expect things that they shouldn't expect. One is, and again, I, I find this with programmers more than technicians, but programmers like to say, oh, that's easy. Well, 
easy doesn't mean fast, and easy doesn't mean cheap. Easy means it's fairly straightforward and tedious work. So it might be 60 hours of easy, but to a programmer it's easy. To the client it sounds like it's less expensive. So never let anybody use the terms it's easy or no problem. <laughs> if you say we can get started right away, you better be willing to come back from lunch and start the project. So otherwise that, that can get you into trouble. So you have to be very careful that, that you manage their expectations with things like that. On the other hand, if you manage projects well, if you divide it into manageable pieces, you can promise amazing things like a zero downtime migration. That is actually possible if you have the right tools and you have to set things up the right way. One of the things that I think in our space that, that we tend not to do is to divide things up into small manageable blocks. You know, there, there's an old saying, how does an ant eat an elephant? One bite at a time, right? And instead, we don't look at it one bite at a time. We look at the project of, uh, we're going to straighten out exchange. So you sit down and you start typing. And you haven't got a plan, and you don't know what you're going to do, and you don't know, you know, you're not necessarily after the bigger picture. You just want to fix the problem. And fixing problems is fun. That's why we get into this business. But a little step back and doing a little planning will make that much more profitable. So when you look at the binder, I, I literally want you to write out one paragraph on each of these stages, like what it means in words that the client will understand, and then create service requests for each of those things. And everything that's outside the scope of that is outside the scope of the project. Once you've got that binder, because even though you're going to do it all, you're going to have electronic you know, PSA stuff, you still want to have that binder you can carry around so you can flip to a page and instantly know what's going on. It will allow you to manage um, additional people. If you've got a user group that you can call on, you can hire other technicians to help you. And you can have longer term projects. And you can have very, very complicated projects. And all of that is manageable because you've divided the work into small pieces that can be farmed out to other people. You'll also find that you can do some really super cool projects when you only need one superstar for just a tiny piece of the project. And the rest of it, when you've divided it down into smaller pieces, lots of people can do the training. Lots of people can do the workstation migration. Lots of people can manage moving data. Uh, you don't need to be an MCSE to copy data from one server to another. right? So you can hire out folks who um, don't necessarily have to be superstars doing all of the work on a project. And you know, I really sincerely believe that getting away from that I have to do it all myself mentality will make you more profitable. It's also the case that if somebody disappears, I mean, I literally have, I remember this one guy, uh, he went to lunch one day and never came back. And you know, it was like he never even asked for his paycheck. He just like, whatever it was that we were doing, he, he was not happy. So, or maybe he got another job, I don't know. But, uh, you know, there are people who, you know, go away at lunch and never come back. So, you know, how do you pick up where they left off? Well, they have to be trained in such a way that uh, you know exactly where they are in the checklist. So after the project is over, you've now done superhuman things that no one thought were possible because you managed it properly. So you want to evaluate what was what worked well. And I always like to have that evaluation in person with the owner, not some piece of paper that they fill out or some little form that got shot out of your PSA. And the reason for that is perception, perception, perception. I've had clients where we have had a truly perfect migration. And when it was over, I go to the client and say, so what did, you know, how did it go for you? And, and had a client say, I didn't expect downtime on the second day. And you're like, whoa, 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 what are you talking about? And there was some issue with her printer. And it happened in the middle of the project. It was completely 100% unrelated to the project. But for her, she couldn't print, and there was what she called downtime in the second day of that project. And you know, there, there's not much you can do about that except be aware of it and try to educate them. But don't assume that just because you had what you think is a perfect project that your client also has the same perception. You need to have that face-to-face. -face and, and to be honest, if it was perfect, let them tell you that, bask in the glory of that. Let them hear their, the words coming out of their mouth of how amazing you are, and then ask them if they can write a referral that you can put on your website. 
It's also important to note um, how accurate your estimates were. Like, were you over budget, under budget? Did you budget? You know, a lot of people, they, they define, literally define how long it takes to build a server on the first time they do a server. And then two years later, that server takes an extra hour. And they're losing money on every single project because their estimates are wrong. So you, you need to always be working on that feedback loop. So we talked about all of the things that were challenges in our space, and I think we've addressed them all. The, the huge one, the big one, is scope creep. You should, you should really, honestly, I recommend that you get two tattoos, one on your left arm that says inside the scope, and one on your right arm that says outside the scope. And if you memorize those two phrases, inside the scope of the project, outside the scope of the project, that will make your projects profitable. And you need to echo that to your clients. You need to make sure your technicians understand it, that every piece of the process is either inside the scope or outside the scope. And when you clearly uh, verify what's inside the scope, and that gets better and better and better over time, you'll become more profitable over time. So I really encourage you to take the time to implement this and to, if you, again, if you don't have a PSA, and I don't sell PSAs, right? But if you don't have a PSA, get one. Do this work inside your PSA. It will be more profitable. Um, and just remember, this closed loop is the thing that gets it all done. Um, you want to be able to document it and then do as much as you can on checklists. And just literally think of it in terms of checklists. Think of it in terms of projects. And you will be able to create repeatable success. So now it's time for the final exam. The single most important concept for completing projects on time and under budget well, um, completing all established goals, is the scope of the project. So that concept that you need to deal with. Everything is either inside the scope or outside the scope. And there we go. That was it for me. Uh, I do have a discount code over at smbbooks.com. So anybody who is um, part of the SMB Nation tribe, just put in the code SMB Nation 20 and you get 20% off. And that is good through the end of this year, 2014. So having said that, are there any questions while I take a sip of uh, coffee? Yeah, Carl, we do have um, a question. Keith would like to know what the PSA were, PSAs were that you mentioned, if you could list them off again. Sure. So the three monsters. You know, the, the, the only three that really I would consider in this space are ConnectWise, Autotask, and TigerPaw. And TigerPaw is probably best for folks that have got a number of technicians. If you've got one or two, it, it's uh, a little more cumbersome to deal with. Um, but ConnectWise, Autotask, and TigerPaw. Great, thank you. Um, and He's wondering, uh, oh, sorry, we have another question come in. Do you have templates of the checklists available? Well, I have a few here and there. Um, to be honest, on my blog, which is there at the bottom, Small Biz Thoughts, uh, I have some checklists. Like you can, uh, you can go get the new PC checklist. Just go to the blog, and then in the search within the blog, just put, uh, I guess, put the word checklist. You'll probably get 7,000 hits. But PC checklist should narrow it down. I have a number of them there. Oh, great! Thank you. Um, that's all the so the, that's all the questions that I see for right now. Um, so I, I'll just do kind of a last call. Does anyone else have? Okay, and there we go. Um, Michael Madonna says, "Where can I find information on how to learn to remove downtime, server projects, hosted migrations, etc.?" How to uh, reduce downtime? Um, well, I mean, obviously, all of my books are spectacular. We, we actually have a book on uh, my brother, Manuel, and I have been doing this for many, many years. We wrote a book that's 590 pages on how to migrate from one set of hardware to another with zero downtime for any uh, you know, company-wide system. Uh, and that includes like a 220-page checklist. Uh, and it's called The Network migration workbook and it's at smbbooks.com <coughs> so but you know part of it is also uh, like some of the pieces within that book are you know just the concept of well 
how do you move a specific thing with zero downtime? And you have to think in, in those terms. Uh, email is probably the easiest. I've got a book on project management where I've got a specific example of how to move email with zero downtime. The really good news is that as we move to the cloud, more and more of us are finding that migrating to the cloud is much easier with zero downtime because you've got the local system working, you mirror it up in the cloud, and you gradually move people over from local to cloud, uh, and then you take the local system down. And so that's just a matter of going really, really slow and being careful about what you do. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah, and I can say um, from personal experience that we do have a lot of Carl's books in in our office at SMB Nation headquarters as well, and we do use them on a regular basis. So they're, they're great resources. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So if there are, are no more questions, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap up. Um, I just do want to take a couple moments to thank Carl for taking time out of his schedule today to, to speak with you guys. He's always a treat, I know. But um, it's, it is really, uh, I think this was a really great presentation. And I just want to reiterate that we will have a recording out to you guys within 24 hours. Um, it'll be an unlisted YouTube link, so just watch for an email from me tomorrow morning and let me know if there are any questions or concerns about it. Uh, Carl, if you have anything else to say, go for it. Well, the only other thing is that um, we're going to be back next month with the second part of Project Management where we're going to talk about the actual execution on the day that you're on site with a project. How, how do you go about executing that uh, in you know real time? So that's kind of the second part of this two-part on uh, project management. So I'll be back. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, great. Okay, yeah, I know we're looking forward to it. So I hope everyone has a great day, and we'll see you all next time.